A nurse accused of murdering seven premature babies and trying to kill ten more took up to three attempts to poison infants by injecting insulin, milk or even air into their bodies, a court heard today. Lucy Letby, 32, is alleged to have gone on a year-long killing spree while working at the Countess of Chester Hospital, including one child who died less than 90 minutes after being handed into her care. Today, the specially trained ICU nurse was described as a, quote, constant malevolent presence, end quote, on the Cheshire Children's Unit, where she allegedly killed and injured many vulnerable children, including twins. She is accused of using night shifts to launch many attacks because she knew parents were unlikely to visit the neonatal ward. Several babies were allegedly poisoned with insulin and one child, known as Baby E, was murdered when Letby allegedly injected him with air, Manchester Crown Court has heard. It caused what doctors call an air embolus, which leads to strokes or heart attacks. Letby is also accused of pumping dangerous levels of milk into the premature children via feeding tubes or veins. She allegedly targeted twins on more than one occasion, and in some cases one was murdered and their siblings survived. Letby was questioned by police during interviews over why she had tracked the families of her alleged victims on Facebook, with prosecutors saying today that this was an unusual interest. Opening at the prosecution, Nick Johnson KC said, quote, Sometimes a baby that she succeeded in killing was not killed the first or even the second time she tried. Sometimes they were injected with air, both intravenously into the blood and via the nasogastric tube into the stomach. Sometimes they were injected with milk or some other fluid. Sometimes it was insulin. But the constant presence was Lucy Letby, end quote. She is facing 22 charges concerning 17 babies, some of whom she allegedly attempted to murder multiple times. Let's be pleaded not guilty to each charge this morning. Mr Johnson said Letby was a constant malevolent presence at a closely restricted neonatal unit. He added, quote, It is a hospital like so many others in the UK. But unlike many other hospitals in the UK, and unlike many other neonatal units in the UK, Within the neonatal unit at the Countess of Chester Hospital, a poisoner was at work, end quote. The prosecutor said two babies, referred to as Baby F and Baby L for legal reasons, were poisoned by Letby deliberately with insulin. They were attacked allegedly eight months apart, with each of them from separate sets of twins. Both boys' blood sugar inexplicably dropped to dangerous levels, but both survived because of the skill of the staff in a neonatal unit, the court heard. He said both of the twins injected with insulin each had a baby brother, Baby E and Baby M, who were both also allegedly attacked by Letby. The court heard one of the means by which Baby E was killed and Baby M was harmed was by having air injected into the bloodstream. Baby M had mercifully survived. He said, quote, babies who had not been unstable at all suddenly severely deteriorated. Sometimes babies who had been sick and then on the mend deteriorated for no apparent reason. Having searched for a cause, which they were unable to find, the consultants found the inexplicable collapses and deaths did have one common denominator. The presence of one of the neonatal nurses. That nurse was Lucy Letby. During the time Letby worked on the night shift, there was a rise in babies dying or falling seriously ill, Manchester Crown Court was told. And then when she moved to the day shift, there were more inexplicable collapses and deaths. Letby, 32, allegedly tried to kill one baby girl three times and a baby boy three times, including two attempts in one day. Many of the events in this case occurred on the night shifts, said Mr Johnson. Although when Lucy Letby was moved onto day shifts towards the end of this period, the collapses and deaths moved to the day shifts, end quote. Referring to the alleged poisoning of both Baby F and Baby L, he added, quote, Lucy Letby was on duty when both were poisoned. We allege that she was the poisoner, end quote. This morning, she was brought into the dock at Manchester Crown Court wearing a dark blue suit with a black blouse. Mr Johnson said, quote, Prior to January 2015, 
The statistics for the mortality of babies in the neonatal unit at the Countess of Chester were comparable to other like units. However, over the next 18 months or so, there was a significant rise in the number of babies who were dying and in a number of serious catastrophic collapses. These rises were noticed by the consultants working at the Countess of Chester and they searched for a cause." End quote. They were concerned that the babies who were dying had deteriorated unexpectedly, despite appropriate medical interventions that would normally have saved them. He said the collapses, quote, defied the normal experience of the treating doctors, end quote. Mr. Johnson said that normally babies might suffer from heart problems, infection or dehydration. Usually when an intervention was undertaken, a positive reaction can be expected, but many of the cases you are going to hear about defied those expectations and norms, he said. Babies who were stable suddenly deteriorated, and sometimes babies who had been sick but were on the mend suddenly deteriorated for no apparent reason. Because of the inability of doctors to find genuine medical reasons for the deaths and collapses, the police were called in. Officers from Cheshire Constabulary commissioned a detailed review by experienced doctors with no connection to the Countess of Chester Hospital. That review suggests that from the middle of 2015 to the middle of 2016, somebody in a neonatal unit poisoned two children with insulin. The prosecution say that the only reasonable conclusion from the evidence will have been that somebody poisoned these babies deliberately with insulin. This was no accident. If the prosecution was right about that, the fact that there were two deliberate poisonings would help the jury decide whether other crimes had been committed or whether they were, quote, just tragic coincidences, end quote. Mr. Johnson went on. We say the collapses and deaths of the 17 babies were not naturally occurring tragedies. They were all the work, we say, of the woman in the dock, who we say was the constant malevolent presence when things turned to the worst for these 17 children. Nick Johnson, KC Prosecuting, said in the case of the two babies injected with insulin, identified only as child F and child L, that their blood sugar levels dropped to dangerous levels. Both survived due to the skill of medical staff, who appreciated that low blood sugar can have natural causes. Mr. Johnson added, quote, What the medical staff did not realise was that in both cases, this was the result of someone poisoning them with insulin, end quote. The prosecutor said nobody would think somebody would be trying to kill babies in a neonatal unit. He said both of the twins injected with insulin each had a baby brother, child E and child M, who were both also allegedly attacked by Letby, one of which did not survive. The court heard one of the means by which the child E was killed and child M was harmed was by having air injected into the bloodstream, what the doctors call an air embolus. Mr. Johnson added, quote, As we go through my introduction of the case, we will see that similar events repeated themselves. The means by which the children in this case were harmed and killed varied, end quote. Prosecutor Mr. Johnson said sometimes babies were injected with air and on other occasions they were fed with insulin or too much milk. He told the court, quote, So varying means by which these babies were attacked, but the constant presence when they were fatally attacked or collapsed catastrophically was Lucy Letby, end quote. Jurors were shown a chart showing nurses who were present on duty when the alleged criminal incidents were said to have taken place. Pointing out as examples the first three alleged offences in time, he said, the chart showed the only person that was present on all three occasions was the defendant. Mr. Johnson said, quote, If you look at the table overall, the picture is, we say, self-evidently obvious. It's a process of elimination, end quote. Mr. Johnson went on. It is a complicated case by any measures. It concerns seven allegations of murder and allegations of attempted murder of ten other children. We allege that sometimes Lucy Letby tried to kill the same baby more than once. Sometimes a baby that she succeeded in killing, she did not manage to kill the first time she tried, or even the second time, and in some cases, even the third time." End quote. He said the defendant was born on January the 4th, 1990, and was originally from Hereford. 
let B study for a nursing degree at the University of Chester, he said, and at the time of the alleged events was a nurse at the Countess of Chester Hospital and had been since she had qualified a few years earlier. She worked throughout the period in consideration at the neonatal unit and prior to her arrest was living at an address in Chester, the court heard. Mr Johnson told the jury, quote, As you know, we have 22 charges, 17 children. In all the cases, Lucy Letby was either responsible for them as their designated nurse or she got involved with them despite not being their designated nurse, end quote. Mr Johnson then turned to the individual cases of each child, starting with child A, which the court heard was the first to be attacked and murdered at just a day old on June 8, 2015. Child A, a baby boy, was born just a minute behind his twin sister at 8.31pm the previous day. The court was told he was born early, by C-section at 31 weeks, and admitted to the intensive care room at a neonatal unit of the hospital. He was in good condition and did well, and by the following morning was breathing in air, that is, without extra oxygen, and was given expressed breast milk, Mr Johnson said. Letby came on to work on the night shift at 7.30pm for the handover from another nurse looking after child A during the day shift. At 8pm, Letby became the designated nurse for child A, but at 8.26pm, she called a doctor to the baby's incubator and the on-call consultant was also alerted. Both doctor and consultant noted a, quote, odd discoloration on the child's skin, patches of pink over blue skin that appeared and disappeared, which became a, quote, hallmark of some of the cases in which Letby had allegedly injected air into the bloodstream of a victim, the court was told. Despite resuscitation attempts, child A was said to have been pronounced dead at 8.58pm, within 90 minutes of Letby coming on duty. The infant's death was referred to a coroner who recorded the cause of death as, quote, unascertained, end quote. The court heard that four medical experts reviewed the case. The first said child A was a, quote, well infant before their death. He said the fatal event was consistent with a deliberate injection of air or something else into the boy's circulation a minute or two before his collapse. A second expert said child A's collapse was not a natural event and added the, quote, most likely reason was air administered deliberately by someone who knew it would cause significant harm. A pathologist concluded it would be reasonable to conclude that air in child A's circulation was most likely caused by air administration through one of two tubes already attached to the baby's body. In her November 2020 interview, it was put to Letby that she had tracked the family of child A on Facebook. She said she had no memory of doing so, but accepted it if there was evidence from her computer. Mr Johnson told the jury, quote, her interest in the families of the children who we say she attacked is another feature of this case which we will see more of as the evidence emerges in more detail. We suggest it is an unusual interest, and we will see in due course that on occasion she searched in quick succession for several of the families of babies whose names appear on the indictment. The court heard that around 28 hours after child A had died, child B was found blue and limp on the ward. Quote, she was blue, she wasn't breathing and she was limp, said Mr Johnson. Child B recovered quickly once resuscitated and survived the incident without suffering any further consequences. A doctor concluded she was, quote, subjected to some form of sabotage before or after midnight on the night of the 9th slash 10th of June 2015, end quote. A second doctor observed the sudden discoloration, profound collapse and relatively quick recovery is rare and only explained by a dose of air administered into the bloodstream, end quote. Family members of some of her alleged child victims sat in the public gallery listening as the names of the children who cannot be named for legal reasons were read out. Earlier, three members of security staff surrounded her as she stood up to enter her pleas as her parents, John and Susan, watched on. Her trial could last up to six months. Letby quietly repeated the words, quote, not guilty, as each of the charges was read out to her by a clerk at Manchester Crown Court. She was standing stock still in the glass panel dock of Court 7. Her once blonde hair, now darkened, let down over her shoulders. 
14 jurors were sworn in to hear the trial. However, two of them will act as substitutes while the prosecution opening is being heard. Once that point has been reached, the trial will continue with 12 jurors. According to the indictment, she tried to kill one baby girl three times and another twice, and she tried to claim the life of a baby boy on three separate occasions, two of them on the same day. In addition to the seven murder charges, Letby faces a further 15 charges of attempted murder relating to 10 premature babies being cared for in the hospital's neonatal unit. All of the alleged murders and attempted murders took place in a 12-month period between June 2015 and June 2016. Evidence on Child C's death. Dr Evans heard that infection was a significant factor in Child C's collapse but could not adequately explain it. He had concerns about Child C's sudden deterioration. As was the case with Child B, the prosecution say Lucy Letby was not the designated nurse for Child C, a baby boy. Letby was assigned to look after a baby girl, and the leading nurse had to reinforce this assignment when the prosecution say Letby was ignoring her. A medical expert concluded Child C was killed by air deliberately put into the nasal gastric tube. The prosecution say this was a variant or refinement of a theme Letby had started with the twins. The prosecution added an independent pathologist said the skin colour changes in Child C were likely caused by prolonged unsuccessful resuscitation. Child C had pneumonia, but the pathologist concluded Child C died as a result of having an excessive quantity of air injected into his stomach via the nasogastric tube. The court has heard Child C was being looked after by a nurse less qualified than Lucy Letby and had been given the responsibility as Child C was stable. That nurse had left to go to the nurse's station in the hospital. While there, she heard Child C's monitor sound an alarm. Upon her return, Letby was already in the room, standing next to Child C's cot. It was the third baby to have suffered a serious deterioration in a matter of a few days, the court heard. Letby was the only nurse who had been on duty for all three collapse incidents for child A, B and C. In police interview, Letby denied she had anything to do with child C other than with the resuscitation. She could not remember why she had ended up in nursery one. In a second interview, asked about text which had been found on her phone placing her in that room, Letby said that she might have been sending them from the nurse's station and then gone into room one, quote, to do something else, end quote. After finishing her night shift, Letby searched on Facebook for Child C's parents. The prosecution say this would have been one of the first things she would have done after that night shift ended. Mr Johnson for the prosecution added, Letby would have been the only adult in the room when Child C collapsed, as was the case with Child A, and was one of only two in the room when Child B collapsed. What we are going to see as we progress is that Lucy Letby's method of attacking the babies in the neonatal unit was beginning to develop, end quote. Child D murder allegation from June 2015. Child D was a baby girl born as full term, i.e. not premature. The court hears there is valid criticism for the hospital, as the mother should have been given antibiotics to stave off infection after her waters broke early, but she was not. Although born healthy, Child D lost colour and became floppy in her father's arms. She was put under observation as she was showing signs of respiratory distress by grunting and her temperature dropped. Child D was admitted to room 1 in the neonatal unit, placed into an incubator and given oxygen therapy and antibiotics. She developed a very high temperature and a rise in her heart rate. She was intubated and ventilated. She improved significantly, but was still affected by her infection. Child D had catheters inserted and the levels of infection dropped. All good signs, Mr Johnson tells the court. A designated nurse other than Letby was assigned care for child D in room 1 on the night shift along with a different child in room 2. Letby was a designated nurse for the other two babies in room 1. On that night shift, child D collapsed three times. The first at around 1.30am, 
the second at 3am and finally at 3.45am. Mr Johnson said, quote, On each occasion those attending were struck by the sight of mottling, poor perfusion and black slash brown discoloration to her skin, mainly over the trunk. We've heard that sort of thing before, haven't we? The prosecution say that this was another case of injecting a child via an IV air embolus. At 1.15am, the designated nurse checked child D, recording observations. At 1.25am, the designated nurse and let B noted the starting of an infusion. An aspirate drawing liquid through the nasal gastric tube is noted at 1.30am. At 1.29am, a doctor noted an unusual spreading rash on child D. There is a note in Lucy Letby's records, she was engaged in the care of a different baby at the time, but the prosecution say nursing notes suggest Letby and the designated nurse called the doctor to the room. The prosecution allege either the notes recorded were simply inaccurate, or Letby was setting herself up with an alibi in someone else's medical records. Child D was successfully resuscitated. At 2.40am, medication was administered by Letby and the designated nurse, who then left to another room. But Child D then collapsed at 3am. Letby was in the room. The designated nurse was not. And no one else had reason to be in the room. Child D was resuscitated again, but according to the prosecution, Letby did not leave things there. At 3.20am, there is a record of Letby starting an infusion, and Letby appears to have remained in the room as a record shows her caring for another baby in the room at 3.30am. At 3.45am, Child D suffered her third and final collapse. CPR began and Child D was pronounced dead at 4.25am. The coroner gave the cause of death as pneumonia with acute lung injury. Medical expert Dr Evans, the prosecution says, observed that a child exhibiting a window of near recovery on two occasions, followed by another collapse, was not consistent with the fatal evolution of antenatal pneumonia. He added the abdominal discoloration was indicative of air embolus. Another medical expert said the clinical status of child D the previous night was not that of a deteriorating baby who would be dead a few hours later. She added the injection of 3 to 5 mil per kilogram of air would be sufficient to kill. The court is told none of the medical staff on duty that night had also been present for the collapses of child A, B or C, other than let B. For nursing staff, two of the nurses had been on duty for one each of the other collapses. Let B in police interview said she, quote, cannot remember, end quote, how she got involved. She seemed to accept that she had administered medication with a syringe at 1.25am, five minutes before the first collapse. In a June 2019 police interview, she said she could not remember calling back the doctor when child D collapsed, but it was possible she had. It was put to Letby in November 2020 that she had searched for the parents of child D on Facebook. She said that she could not recall but accepted that she had done so. She said she could not explain why she had done it. The prosecution said, quote, We suggest that if you search for that family of a baby who you had seen die, you would know and remember why you had done it, end quote. Letby was asked about a text message in which she had referred to, quote, an element of fate being involved. She said that it was, quote, fate that babies get unwell sometimes, end quote, but that she would have to know the context of the message. The prosecution, say for child D, her bad luck, or fate, was the fact that Letby was working in the neonatal unit. The prosecution add all of the children A to D were not expected to have serious problems, but only one of them survived, and only Letby was the constant presence. Child E, murder allegation. Child E, a boy, was born premature in July 2015. The prosecution say this is the twin brother of the child poisoned with insulin. Child E was born weighing less than three pounds. He was given oxygen, then weaned to air, and transferred to nursery one. The court hears child E was at risk of a serious gastrointestinal disorder, NEC, and was started on antibiotics, IV fluids, and caffeine. He had a nasogastric tube inserted. Fluids were inserted the following day via a long line. 
He had a quote, mild transient high blood sugar, which was corrected with a very low dose of insulin, then given tiny quantities of milk the following day every two hours. The following day after that, he had two small vomits and air was aspirated, but otherwise the feeds were well tolerated and increased incrementally to two meal every two hours. The nursing notes indicated he was stable on a tiny dose of insulin to correct the high blood sugar. The prosecution say, at 9pm on August 3rd, 2015, the mother decided to visit her twin sons and interrupted Lucy Letby who was in the process of attacking child E, although the mum quote did not realise it at the time. Child E was acutely distressed and bleeding from the mouth. The mum said Letby attempted to reassure her the blood was due to the NGT irritating the throat. Quote, Trust me, I'm a nurse, end quote, Mr Johnson told the court. Letby said the registrar would be down to review child E and urged her to return to the postnatal ward. The mum called her husband when she had got to the labour ward in a call lasting 4 minutes and 25 seconds at 9.11pm. Letby made a note in child F's records, child F being the twin of child E, after she had got rid of the mum, Mr Johnson said. The next time the mum visited child E, he was in terminal decline. The prosecution say the mum was, quote, fobbed off by Lucy Letby. Two records are made at 4.51am after child E had died. The latter note records, quote, Mummy was present at the start of shift attending to cares. Visited again approximately 2200 hours. Aware that we had obtained blood from his NG tube and was starting some different medications to treat this. She was updated by Reg Redacted and contained Child E. Informed her that we would contact her if any changes. Once Child E began to deteriorate, midwifery staff were contacted, both parents present during recess. End quote. The prosecution say Let B's note suggest the mum was present at the start of the shift, 7.30 to 8 p.m., and returned at 10pm when neither is true. The prosecution say 9pm was an important time, as it was the time child E was due to be fed by his mother's expressed breast milk. The mum said that is why she attended at 9pm, quote, she was bringing the milk, end quote. The phone call at 9.11pm to her husband also fits the mum's timing, the prosecution add. Letby's notes also show, quote, prior to 2100 feed, 16 mil mucky slightly bile-stained aspirate obtained and discarded. Abdo soft, not distended, SHO, senior house officer informed to omit feed, end quote. The prosecution say the nursing notes made are false and fail to mention that child E was bleeding at 9pm. They mention a meeting that neither the registrar or the mother remember. A record of feeds, a feeding chart, is shown to the court. At 9pm, Letby has recorded information to detail the volume of fluids given via the IV line and the line in child E's left leg, and the 9pm feed is omitted. In the 10pm column is 15 mil fresh blood. The SHO said he had no recollection of giving advice to omit the 9pm feed. He was on the paediatric ward most of that night until child E entered a terminal decline. He believes the only time he had anything to do with child E was in a secondary role to the registrar in an examination at 10.20pm. The registrar recalled being told child E had suffered a blood-flecked vomit. He does not recall seeing any blood on child E's face, but regarded the presentation as undramatic. But around half an hour to an hour later, there was a large amount of fresh blood which had come up child E's tube. The prosecution said, quote, this was the first indication of any serious problems so far as the medical staff were concerned. There was a further loss of 13 mils of blood at 2300 hours. 13 mils may not sound much, but the doctor had never seen a small baby bleed like this. This was the equivalent to 25% of child E's blood volume, a figure which the prosecution say is an underestimate in context. The prosecution add that at 11.40pm, child E suffered a sudden desaturation. His abdomen developed a striking discoloration with flitting white and purple patches. CPR was started, but child E continued to bleed. Although Letsby was participating in the resuscitation of child E, she co-signed for medication given to another baby in room 4. 
Child E was pronounced dead at 1.40am. The on-call consultant said Child E was a high-risk infant who had shown signs of NEC. The parents did not wish to have a post-mortem, the consultant did not deem one necessary, and the coroner's office agreed. The prosecution say, quote, as subsequent reviews have established, that was a big mistake, end quote. Dr Evans said Child E's death was the result of a combination of an air embolus and bleeding which was indicative of trauma. The air embolus was intentionally introduced into Child E's bloodstream via an IV line to cause significant harm. Medical expert Dr Bohin agreed the cause of death was air embolus and acute bleeding. She concluded that the cause of the bleeding was unknown, but acknowledged fleetingly rare possible natural causes that could not be ruled out in the absence of a post-mortem. Dr Bohin concentrated on the abdominal discoloration and concluded that air was deliberately introduced via an intravenous line. The court is reminded by the prosecution that, once again, only Lucy Letby was the constant presence for all of the collapses in children A to E. In police interview, Letby said she could remember child E and he was stable at the time of the handover, with nothing of concern before the large bile aspirate. She said she and another member of staff had disposed of the aspirate and the advice was to omit the feed. She said child E's abdomen was becoming fuller and there was a purple discoloration, so had asked a doctor to review child E. She said she had got blood from the NG tube. She was asked about the 10pm note and said if there had been any blood prior to the 9pm feed, quote, she would have noted it. She said it was after 9pm that the SHO had reviewed child E, but she could not recall if it was a face-to-face -face or over the phone. She said she could remember the mum leaving after the 10pm visit. In a June 2019 interview, she was pressed over a conversation with the SHO. She said she had no independent memory of it. She said she could not remember the mum coming into the room at 9pm with milk, nor the child E being upset with blood coming from the mouth. She said she would not have told the mum to go back upstairs. Quote, We have a stark contrast between what the mum says and what Lucy Letby says, Mr Johnson tells the court. You know he was due to be fed. Breast milk. You know, we say, that is why the mum was there. This has been wiped out of the records by Lucy Letby because she knows the consequences of the mum being right about this. In a November 2020 interview, Letby is asked why she had sent a text referring to child E and queried whether he had Down syndrome. She said she could not remember whether there had ever been any mention of Downs in the medical notes. The prosecution say Lucy Letby, quote, took an unusual interest, end quote, in the family of child E. She did social media searches on the parents two days after child E's death and on August the 23rd, September the 14th, October the 5th, November the 5th, December the 7th and even on December the 25th. The prosecution say there were further searches in January 2016. Mr Johnson will now be giving details of the prosecution's case for child F, the twin brother of child E. Child F attempted murder allegation by method of insulin poisoning. The prosecution say Child F was marginally the younger of the twins and he required some resuscitation at birth and later intubated, ventilated and given a medicine to help his lungs. He was recorded as having high blood sugar so was prescribed a tiny dose of insulin. He had his breathing tube removed and was given some breathing support. Child F had small amounts of breast milk and given fluid nutrients via a long line. If it is known in advance that a baby cannot have milk and needs to be fed fluids, then a TPN bag is prepared by the aseptic pharmacy unit, APU, and a COCH on receipt of a prescription. The pharmacy bag is delivered back to the ward and is bespoke, prepared for an individual patient. If, for whatever reason, there is no need for a TPN bag, there are a couple of stock bags kept in reserve. As a matter of practice, insulin is never added to a TPN bag. Insulin is given via its own infusion, usually in a syringe which delivers an automatic dose over a period of time. The prosecution adds insulin is not added to a TPN bag as it would stick to the plastic or bind to the bag, making it difficult to accurately give a reliable dose. 
Early on August 4th, child E had died. Later that day, the pharmacy received a prescription for a TPN bag for child F, the twin brother. A confirmation document was printed at 12.32pm for child F. The pharmacist produced a handwritten correction to say it was to be used within 48 hours of 11.30pm that day. The TPN bag was delivered up to the ward at 4pm that day. On that night shift, the designated nurse for child F in room 2 was not Letby. Letby had a single baby to look after that night, also in room 2. There were seven babies in the unit that night, with five nurses working. Letby and the designated nurse signed the prescription chart to record the TPN bag was started and administered via a long line at 12.25am. A TPN chart is a written record for putting up the bags and was used for child F. It includes lipids, nutrients for babies not being given milk. Let's be signed for the TPN bag to be used for 48 hours. There are two further prescriptions for TPN bags to run for 48 hours. Following the conclusion of a let be night shift, after the administration of a TPN bag let be had co-signed for, a doctor instructed the nursing staff to stop the TPN via the long line and provide dextrose, sugar, to counteract the fall in blood sugar and moved the TPN to a peripheral line while a new long line was put in. Child F's blood glucose increased before falling back. A new bespoke TPN was made for child F delivered at 4pm. The prosecution say this could not have been the same one fitted to child F at noon that day, which would have been either a bespoke bag which Lucy let be co-signed for, or a stock bag from the fridge. Mr Johnson said child F's low blood sugar continued in the absence of Lucy Letby. Child F's blood sample at 5.56pm had a glucose level which was very low, and after he was taken off the TPN and replaced with dextrose, his blood glucose levels returned to normal by 7.30pm. He had no further episodes of hypoglycemia. These episodes were sufficiently concerning that medical staff checked child F's blood plasma level. The 5.56pm sample recorded a very high insulin measurement of 4657. Child F's hormone level of C-peptide was very low, less than 169. The combination of the two levels, the prosecution say, means someone must have been given or taken synthetic insulin. It's the only conclusion. We say this means that somebody gave child F synthetic insulin. Somebody poisoned him. All experienced medical and nursing members of staff would know the dangers of introducing insulin into any individual whose glucose values were within the normal range and would know that extreme hypoglycemia over a prolonged period of time carries life-threatening risks. No other baby on the neonatal unit was prescribed insulin at the time. Mr Johnson continued, to give child F insulin, someone would have had access to the locked fridge, use a needle and syringe to remove some insulin, or if they didn't do it that way, go to the cot side and inject the insulin directly into the infant through the intravenous system, intramuscular injection or, and this is what we say happened, via the TPN bag. Medical experts Dr Evans and Dr Bowen said the hormone levels were consistent with insulin being put into the TPN bag prior to child F's hypoglycemic episode. You know who was in the room and you know who hung up the bag, Mr Johnson told the jury. Professor Peter Hindmarsh said that insulin had to have gone in through the TPN bag as the hypoglycemia persisted for such a long time, despite five injections of 10% dextrose. Professor Hindmarsh said the following possibilities happened. That the same bag was transferred over the line, that the replacement stock bag was contaminated, or that some part of the giving set was contaminated by insulin from the first TPN bag, which are bound to the plastic and therefore continue to flow through the hardware even after a non-contaminated bag was attached. There can be no doubt that somebody contaminated that original bag with insulin. Because of that, the problem continued through the day. Letby was interviewed by police in July 2018 about that night shift. She remembered child F but had no recollection of the incident and, quote, had not been involved in his care, end quote. She was asked about the TPN bag charts. She said the TPN was kept in a locked fridge and the insulin was kept in that same fridge. She confirmed her signature on the TPN form. She had no recollection of having had involvement with administering the TPN bag contents to child F, 
but confirmed giving child F glucose injections and taken observations. She also confirmed signing for a lipid syringe at 12.10am at the shift before. The prosecution say she should have had someone to co-sign for it. She accepted that the signature tended to suggest that she had administered it. Interestingly, at the end of this part of the interview, she asked whether the police had access to the TPN bag that she had connected. In a June 2019 police interview, Let's Be agreed with the idea that insulin would not be administered accidentally. In November 2020, she was asked why she had searched for the parents of child E and F. She said she thought it might be to see how child F was doing. She was asked about texting child F's blood sugar levels to an off-duty colleague at 8am. She said she must have looked on his chart. Mr Johnson told the court, The fact it was done through the TPN bag tells you it wasn't a mistake. Whoever was doing it was to avoid detection. Only a few people had the opportunity. We suggest there is only one credible candidate for the poisoning, the one who was present for all of the unexpected collapses and deaths at the neonatal unit, end quote. Child G attempted murder allegations, three attempts. Mr Johnson said Child G, born in May 2015 at Arrow Park Hospital, was a baby girl and born very premature, weighing one pound and two ounces. Child G suffered bleeding on her lungs and had nine blood transfusions with a number of septic or suspected septic episodes requiring antibiotics, but improved and was transferred to the Countess of Chester Hospital's neonatal unit in August and was clinically stable, being fed expressed breast milk. On the night in September, Child G was in Nursery 2, with a designated nurse not let be. There were seven babies in the unit with five nursing staff. It was a milestone night for Child G and nurses marked the occasion with a small celebration. Child G was being fed every three hours alternatively by bottle and nasogastral tube. At 2am, a feed had shown minimal aspirated partially digested milk. The nurse took her scheduled one hour break. Nothing is recorded on who was asked to keep an eye on Child G, Mr Johnson added. At 2.15am, the shift leader said she was sat with Lucy Letby when she heard Child G vomiting, along with Child G's monitor alarm going off. They ran into her nursery. Child G had vomited violently and suffered a collapse. The prosecution said medical records suggest the shift leader's memory of being with Lucy Letby for a period of time before this event cannot be accurate. The prosecution say, despite Child G's stomach being pretty much empty prior to her feed, 45 mils of milk was aspirated from her NGT. But, the prosecution say, 45 mils of milk had been administered for her feed, which then did not explain what accounted for the vomit. Subsequent x-rays showed air in the abdomen and intestines. Child G suffered further deteriorations. During intubation, a doctor noticed blood-stained fluid from the trachea, something the prosecution say was consistent with what was seen in other collapses in the case so far. At 6.05am, following a further desaturation, 100 mils of air was aspirated from the NG tube. When the tube was removed, the registrar noted thick secretions in her mouth and a blood clot at the end of her breathing tube. There were also signs of infection. Child G was transferred to Arrow Park before returning to the Countess neonatal unit just over a week later. Five days after her return to the Countess, Child G was due to receive her immunisations such was her improved condition. A team of nurses came on the day shift that day, Lucy Letby being among them. Letby was Child G's designated nurse that day. Child G was fed with 40 mil via NG tube by Letby at 9.15am. At about 10.20am, Child G had projectile vomited twice for several seconds, the court is told. Child G's blood saturations fell to 30%, the same problem she had faced two weeks prior. A nurse took over the care from Letby at 11.30am as Letby was looking after two other children in room 4. The nurse took all the observations and noted Child G was connected to a Massimo monitor, which measures oxygen saturations and heart rate levels. It is a device which stays on and cannot be turned off by a baby. At 3.30pm, a consultant doctor was called to cannulate Child G. Privacy screens were erected and Child G was on a trolley with the monitor still attached. The nurse went on to care for another baby. The consultant doctor said he could not recall if Child G's monitoring equipment was switched off during the cannula fitting, 
but it is his practice to transfer the sensor from one limb to another, or if temporary detachment is required, to reattach the monitor as soon as possible. He added if child G was not stable, he would not have left her. After the doctors had gone, the nurse responded to Lucy Letby's shout for help. When she attended, child G's monitor had been switched off. The power was off. Child G was struggling to breathe. Letby was giving ventilation breaths. Child G responded to the treatment. In a text sent by Letby to a colleague, she wrote, Child G, quote, looked rubbish when I took over this morning. Then she vomited at nine and I got her screened. Mum said she hasn't been herself for a couple of days, end quote. But the prosecution said Child G had been due to have her immunisations, something which would not have been completed if Child G had not been well. The prosecution say Child G had vomited because she'd been given excessive milk and air. A subsequent MRI scan revealed neurological changes and, in August 2016, it was revealed Child G had suffered irreversible brain damage. Mr Johnson said, quote, Someone had switched off the monitor when Child G collapsed, and she was discovered by Lucy Letby. The overfeeding doesn't happen by accident. He added similar cases will be heard with other babies. In police interview, Letby said she remembered the nurse had been on her break when the incident happened with Child G in Nursery 2. She could not remember who had been assigned to look after her. Letby suggested that excess air in Child G after the vomiting was the result of some sort of infection or as a consequence of the vomiting. She said she had withdrawn the 45 mils of milk after that episode and air had come with it, and she had seen Child G vomiting. She said she did not know why she had gone into the room, but it was possible it was a result of hearing Child G vomiting. Letby, quote, vaguely recalled the day Child G vomited after her return to the hospital, accepting she had been the designated nurse. She had no recollection of Child G vomiting. In a subsequent interview, Letby accepted there were only two alternatives to the first vomiting incident, that Child G had been fed far more than she should have been, or she had not digested her earlier feed. She accepted that the clear inference to be drawn was that Child G had been given excess milk and air via the NGT. She denied responsibility for either of those eventualities. For the second incident, let be denied either overfeeding or injecting air into Child G's stomach. In November 2020, let be denied to police that she had switched off the Massimo monitor. She was asked about Facebook searches carried out on the day of the second vomiting incident that Letby looked up the parents of Child G. She said, quote, she had no recollection of them, end quote. The prosecution say that within a minute or two of looking at the mother of Child G on Facebook, she then looked at the mums of two other babies listed in the charges. One was the mum who the prosecution said interrupted the attack by Letby on Child E. Mr Johnson states, The practice of the nurses on the NNU was to use the NGT to check whether an infant had an empty stomach before feeding. That was done in Child G's case. Nothing came up, which means there was nothing in her stomach. She was then fed and her designated nurse went on a break. Fifteen minutes later, Child G produced projectile vomits of such force that they left the cot and landed on the floor and nearby chair. Child G collapsed and stopped breathing. An amount of feed was aspirated from her NGT equal to what she had been given about 15 minutes earlier together with lots of air. There was a similar episode a few weeks later. These were not naturally occurring or random events. They were deliberate attempts to kill using a slightly different method by whilst Lucy Letby sought to give the appearance of chance events in the neonatal units at the Countess of Chester Hospital. We are into day three of the prosecution opening in the Lucy Letby trial. The court shall hear the prosecution's version of events which led to the collapses of Child H. Child H attempted murder allegation. Child H was born in September 2015 and had breathing difficulties shortly after birth. She was transferred to neonatal unit nursery room one. Independent experts say there was an unacceptable delay intubating her and administering a protein which helps the lungs, which the prosecution say means the case is complicated by, quote, suboptimal treatment at the hospital. 
Additionally, Child H was put on a ventilator. She was not paralysed. She was also left with butterfly needles in her chest for prolonged periods, which may have punctured her lung tissues and contributed to further punctured lungs. The prosecution say Letby attempted to kill Child H on September 26th at 3.24am and on September 27th at 12.55am. Mr Johnson said Child H had previously deteriorated on the night of September 23rd and required ventilator support and intubation, followed later by oxygen support. The court hears Child H responded to intervening treatment, but the saturations were quote, frequent and significant. Mr Johnson said all but two events could be explained medically and responded to with routine resuscitative measures. The two events in the early hours of September 26th and 27th were quote, uncharacteristic and required CPR. Letby was on duty for both those night shifts and was the designated nurse for Child H. That night, Child H was given a blood transfusion. At 2.15am, medical notes by a doctor showed a reaccumulation of a left-sided pneumothorax. A further chest drain was inserted to relieve the pressure. The ICU chart shows that Letby recorded having given Child H a dose of morphine at 1.25am and a dose of saline at 2.50am. The saline bolus was set up to run for 20 minutes and would therefore have ended at 3.10am. Lucy Letby would have had the cover of legitimacy for accessing Child H's lines just before she collapsed again. At 3.22am, Child H collapsed and required CPR. The attending doctor said the cause was unclear. He concluded the episode was hypoxia, shortage of oxygen. Letby made notes at 4.14am, recording a lowering of the heart rate at 11.30pm which required treatment. She recorded the additional chest drain and a blood transfusion at 2am. Of the collapse at 3.22am, she recorded, quote, profound desaturation and colour loss to 30%, good chest movement and air entry, colour change on CO2 detector, Neopuff commenced in 100% oxygen and help requested. Serious fluid from all three drains became bradycardiac. DRS crash called and recess commenced as documented. End quote. At 5:21 a.m., let's be recorded a conversation between herself, the attending doctor, and Child H's parents. During the following day, Child H was relatively stable. A different nurse was designated nurse for Child H, still in room one, on the night of September the 26th. Letby was also on duty. The designated nurse, quote, could not recall if she had taken a break during the shift, but there would have been time she would have gone out of the room to get a drink or retrieve something from a cupboard. Letby was looking after a child in room two. Child H suffered two sudden and unexpected episodes of profound desaturation at 12.55 a.m. and 3.30 a.m. The registrar responded to the emergency calls and on one occasion saw Letby administering treatment and took the history from her, assuming she was the designated nurse. The nurse noted, quote, pink tinged secretions around child H's mouth. The prosecution say this was a similar finding to that found on three other babies in the case so far. The nurse noted a profound desaturation, a profound drop in Child H's blood despite air going into the lungs and carbon dioxide coming out. Both collapses at 12.55am and 3.30am had quote, no known cause. Child H was transferred to Arrow Park Hospital at 5.25am and was stabilised en route in the ambulance. Her mother, who was with her, spoke of a quote, dramatic improvement as soon as Child H got to the hospital. Child H returned to the Countess of Chester Hospital and the rest of her time was uneventful before being discharged. The court hears she had not suffered any permanent consequences. The prosecution says medical expert Dr Evans said there was quote, no obvious explanation for Child H's deterioration in those two early morning collapses. Dr Sandy Bowen quote, expressed concern at those events and the collapses were more significant than the others for which there are obvious clear medical explanations. She was also critical of the way the chest drains were inserted and managed. Letby was interviewed in 2018 by police. 
She confirmed she had remembered child H because she had chest drains, which the court hears are a fairly rare thing these days. For the second incident, let be said she had not been a designated nurse, so assumed she had not been caring for child H. She identified her signatures on two medicine administrations. In 2019, she identified her signature on more documents. In this interview, she told police she had not been a designated nurse, but had been giving her treatment at the time child H collapsed. On October the 5th, 2015, the prosecution say let be searched for the mum of child H, the father of children E and F, and the mother of child I. It was her day off. Mr Johnson said, quote, We say this has to be looked at in the context of everything else. We say it is more than an innocent coincidence that once child H was moved out of the Countess of Chester Hospital, she had no further problems, end quote. Child I murder allegation. Child I was born in Liverpool Women's Hospital premature in August 2015. The prosecution say let be made four attempts to kill child I, succeeding on the fourth attempt. Child I was born weighing two pounds two ounces, but in good condition. She was intubated and ventilated, then supported by CPAP and fed through a nasogastric tube. Child I, by late September, had diminished clinical concerns and no breathing problems. For what the prosecution say was the first attempt, Letby was on a long day shift, 8am to 8pm on September the 30th. She was Child I's designated nurse in room 3. According to Child I's mum, Letby expressed concern about the child and indicated Child I would be reviewed by a doctor. When she made a nursing note, let me quote, reverse the concern, and said it was the mum who had raised the concern about the abdomen, saying it was more distended to yesterday, and child I was quiet, not on monitor, but nil increased work of breathing, end quote. A review took place at 3pm, over an hour after these notes. Child I appeared mottled in colour with a distended abdomen and prominent veins. A feeding chart showed 35 mils was given to child I when asleep, but Letby had recorded child I as, quote, handling well and waking for feeds, end quote. At 4pm, Letby recorded feeding child I 35 mils of expressed breast milk via the NGT. An emergency crash call was called at 4.30pm as child I had vomited, desaturated, her heart rate had dropped and she was struggling to breathe. Her airway had to be cleared and she was given breathing support and child I was transferred to room 1. An x-ray at 5.39pm revealed a massive amount of gas in her stomach and bowels. Her lungs appeared squashed and of small volume. The prosecution say air had been injected into the NGT to give a splinted diaphragm. A doctor recorded child I had suffered a respiratory arrest at 4.30pm. Struggling to breathe, she was pale and distressed and the abdomen was distended and hard. The NGT was aspirated and produced air and two mils of milk, after which child I improved. The prosecution says this is at odds with the 35 mils of milk child I was fed at 4pm. The prosecution say, removed from the orbit of Lucy Letby, child I's condition improved. Child I continued to improve and was in nursery room 2 on the night of October the 12th by a designated nurse different to Letby. Letby was looking after a baby in room 1. Child I was being bottle fed every 4 hours and at 1.30am took a 55ml bottle of breast milk. At 3am the designated nurse left the nursery temporarily and said she asked either Letby or another colleague to listen out for Child I. The designated nurse, records show, helped another colleague with something in room 1. The prosecution say it is more likely the nurse would have asked Letby to look out for child I. Upon the designated nurse's return to room 2, Letby was, quote, standing in the doorway of the room, end quote, and Letby said child I, quote, looked pale. The designated nurse switched on the light and saw child I was at the point of death. She later recalled the child was breathing about once every 20 seconds. The prosecution says the jury should consider how Lucy Letby could see a child was looking pale when the room was darkened at 3.20am with minimal lighting. 
The prosecution say the nurse's recollection is right, as Lucy Letby made a note at the end of her shift at 8.10am. Quote, child I noted to be pale, in cot by myself at 3.20 hours. Apnea alarm in situ and had not sounded. On examination, child I, centrally white, minimal shallow breaths, followed by gasping observed, end quote. The registrar was called to the unit at 3.23am. On arrival, he saw the nurses giving child I full CPR. The notes suggest he had to reposition the ETT. A consultant doctor administered adrenaline, intubated and ventilated child I. An x-ray showed gross gaseous distension throughout the bowel and signs of chronic lung disease of prematurity, CLD. Child I, the prosecution say, had the same problem that she had when Letby had fed her on September the 30th. The medical team felt that the abdominal distension had affected her ability to expand the chest and in turn caused desaturation. Both nursing and medical staff commented on a bruise-like discoloration to the right of the sternum. They assumed this was the result of chest compressions. The category of nursing care was raised a level. Ironically, the prosecution say Letby was made a designated nurse as she was more qualified. Medical notes showed that ETT had been, quote, displaced, and at 4.25 a.m., the NGT was, quote, curled in the esophagus, which the prosecution say would have prevented release of the pressure created by excess air in the stomach. For what the prosecution say was the third attempt, Letby had responsibility for child I on the night of October the 13th. Both Letby and a doctor recorded child I had increasing abdominal distension, discoloration to the right, and sensitivity to touch between 5 and 5.55 a.m. The x-ray taken at 6.05 a.m. showed widespread gaseous distension sufficient to splint the diaphragm. This prevented her from breathing properly. Child I had the same problem as before. At 7am, CPR was required as child I had a, quote, significant desaturation. The doctor recorded at 7.10am, quote, desaturating again despite good air entry, chest wall movement and negative cold light, i.e. no pneumothorax. At 7.45am, heart rate below 60, CPR initiated. Capnography positive, chest wall movement and equal AE noted. The prosecution says child I was brought back from the brink of death right at the end of the shift at 7.58 a.m. Let be noted at 8.43 a.m. quote, At 0.500 hours, abdomen noted to be more distended and firmer in appearance with area of discoloration spreading on the right-hand side. Veins more prominent, gradually requiring 100% oxygen. Blood gases poor as charted, nil obtained from NG tube throughout continued to decline. Re-intubated at approximately 0700 hours, initially responded well. Resuscitation commenced as documented in medical notes. Night and day staff members present. That was, the prosecution say, the third attempt at murder. Child I was transferred to Arrow Park Hospital. She had an episode of bradycardia and desaturations after which she quickly stabilised. The prosecution say, once again, a child had recovered quickly out of the care of Let B. Child I was transferred back to the Countess of Chester Hospital on October the 17th. On the night of October the 22nd, Let B was on a night shift, with a different nurse being designated nurse for Child I. Between 8pm and Child I's collapse, the only entry Let B made in any child's records was those in her charge in room 3. The prosecution say it was, from her records, a slow night for her. Just before midnight, Child I became unsettled. Let B and another nurse attended to her, but Child I collapsed and required CPR. The on-call registrar noted Child I had a mottled blue appearance of the trunk and peripheries. After five minutes of CPR, Child I's saturation rate returned to 100% and she recovered to the point of rooting, i.e. sign of hunger, and was fighting the ventilator i.e. trying to breathe independently. The ET tube was removed at 12.45 a.m. At 1.06 a.m., a nurse, having left the nursery temporarily, responded to Child I's alarm and saw Lucy Letby at the incubator. Child I was very distressed and wanted to intervene, but Letby assured her that they would be able to settle the baby. Quote, Don't worry, we will sort it out, Mr. Johnson tells the jury. 
child eye then collapsed. The on-call doctor arrived and resuscitation attempts were made. Purple and white mottling were noted on child eye skin. All resuscitative efforts were unsuccessful and treatment was withdrawn at 2.10am and child eye was pronounced dead at 230 in the immediate aftermath, Child Eye's parents were taken to a private room. As the mum bathed her recently deceased child, Lucy Letby came into the room and, in the words of the mum quote, was smiling and kept going on about how she was present at Child Eye's first bath and how much Child Eye had loved it, end quote. The cause of death was given by the coroner as hypoxic ischemic damage of brain and chronic lung due to extreme prematurity. All loops of bowel showed significantly dilated lumen due to increased air content. In layman's terms, they were expanded like a partially inflated balloon. There was no signs of NEC or any other bowel problem. The prosecution say there were signs of earlier hypoxic ischemic damage. In other words, the earlier attempts to kill her had caused brain damage resulting from a shortage of oxygen. Medical expert Dr Evans said he believed the apnea monitor might have been switched off on October 13 for child eye and the deliberate administering of a large bolus of air into child eye stomach via her NG tube on October 22 or 23. In police interview, Letby said she could not remember the circumstances of September 30 and had taken over the care of child eye after the child had a quote episode. She said she had no recollection of the events surrounding Child Eye's death and said the child had been returned from Arrow Park Hospital too quickly. In June 2019, she was asked about a sympathy card she had sent to the child's parents. She said it was not normal to do so and this was the only time she had done it. She accepted having an image of that card on her phone. She was asked about the October 13th incident and challenged the nurse's account, adding, quote, Maybe I spotted something that the nurse wasn't able to spot, end quote, as she was, quote, more experienced. She was asked why she had searched for the parents' details on Facebook. She said she did not recall doing it. The prosecution say Child Eye was doing well by the time Lucy Letby got her hands on her. Quote, what happened followed the pattern of what happened to others before and what has yet to happen to others. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, came vomiting, breathing problems and critical desaturations. It was persistent, it was calculated, it was cold-blooded. Child J attempted murder charge. Child J, a girl, was initially stable, but it was discovered she had a necrotic and perforated bowel. She was transferred to Alderhay for surgery to fit her with a stoma bag. Child J, quote, recovered well and was taken to the Countess of Chester Hospital on November the 10th, 2015. She had a relatively rare type of intravenous line fitted, a, quote, Broviac line. On November the 16th, medical notes refer to her as being well. But on November the 27th, she suffered an unexplained collapse in the early hours. Letby was on duty. Before she went to work for that shift, Lucy Letby exchanged text messages with one of her colleagues. The prosecution say it seemed that she was not happy with working conditions and she referred to the difficulties of looking after the babies who just needed feeding support. Child J was one of those. The prosecution adds that it appeared working in such nurseries was quote, not sufficiently stimulating for Lucy Letby. Letby was in a different room to child J and was not the designated nurse, but, quote, got involved by co-signing for medication at 12.02am. Letby's colleague was a band 4 nurse and not sufficiently qualified to give intravenous medication. After 4.40am, that nurse thought child J became pale and mottled. She left the room for a short time, and upon her return, another nurse was assisting child J with breathing. The last thing Letby had recorded on notes was at 3am. There is data from the door system showing Letby coming in at 3.47am. The prosecution suggests Letby had been on a break during that time. Just after 5am, Child J suffered another desaturation and she was moved to the high dependency unit in room 2. The registrar was called and Child J was working hard to breathe but had otherwise recovered well. At 6.56am, Child J's alarm sounded and Letby was among those responding. A doctor attended and took control. He noted oxygen levels were, quote, unrecordable and circulation poor. 
there were symptoms of a seizure. At 7.20am, Let's Be co-signed a chart for a 10% glucose infusion. At 7.24am, child J collapsed again. The doctor assisted in resuscitating her. Child J recovered and the doctor could not explain what happened from the results of various tests taken. He considered the events unexplained. Medical expert Dr Evans described the collapse at 7.11am as unexpected without any straightforward explanation. He said that it was, quote, of concern and consistent with some form of obstruction of her airways, such as smothering. The symptoms of a seizure suggested oxygen deprived to the brain. Child J has not suffered a seizure since. Dr Evans added, quote, whilst I have concerns, one cannot rule out the presence of infection, despite the normal inflammatory markers at the time of the two collapse episodes, I note also the presence of the stoma, which could be the source of the organisms that caused her systemic infections, end quote. Dr Evans, in a follow-up statement, maintained, quote, airway obstruction was the most likely cause of child J's collapse. Dr Sandy Bowen concluded that the issue was not infection because there were no soft signs and a gradual deterioration which might be expected, but the collapse was sudden and had caused seizures. In interview, Letby said she had little recollection of Child J, but remembered the Broviac line. She confirmed contact with Child J, but denied doing anything to cause her harm. In 2020, she was asked why she had searched Facebook for Child J's parents. She replied, quote, I don't remember doing that. The prosecution said, quote, it is remarkable that on many occasions, when children who had suffered unexpected, spectacular and life-threatening collapses were removed from her orbit, they had exceptional recoveries, end quote. Child K, murder allegation. Child K was born at the Countess of Chester Hospital in February 2016. Very premature and weighing only 692 grams. There was not time to deliver at a hospital for this type of maternity delivery, Dr. Ravi Jayram, a paediatric consultant, was present at her birth as a result. Lucy Letby booked Child K onto the neonatal unit. Child K had required help with breathing, but was stable and in as good a condition as a baby of that prematurity could be. Arrangements were made for Child K to transfer her to Arrow Park Hospital. At 3.50am, Dr. Jayram was standing at the nurses station compiling his notes. Although he did not have a view into Nursery 1, Dr. Jayram was aware that the designated nurse was not there, a fact backed up by door swipe data. Lucy Letby was the only nurse in room one, alone with child K. Quote, Feeling uncomfortable with this because he was beginning to notice the coincidence between the unexplained deaths and the serious collapses and the presence of Lucy Letby, Dr. Jayram decided to check on where Lucy Letby was and where child K was. As he walked in, he could see Letby standing over child K's incubator. He could see Child K's oxygen levels were falling. However, the alarm was not sounding and Lucy Letby was making no effort to help. Dr. Jayram went straight to treat Child K and found her chest was not moving. He asked Letby if anything had happened, to which she replied, quote, She just started deteriorating now. Dr. Jayram found Child K's breathing tube had been dislodged. Child K was very premature and had been sedated and inactive. The tube had been secured by tape and attached to Child K's headgear. Mr Johnson, quote, It's well recognised if you handle a child you can dislodge the tube accidentally, but any experienced staff member would recognise that. Dr Jayram was troubled as the levels were falling and Nurse Letby had been the only person in the room. The prosecution added, quote, On these monitors, all readings are set to default values in a neonatal unit. Saturation levels falling to the 80s is a serious issue and if the machine is working properly it would sound an alarm. There is an alarm pause button on the screen of the monitor. If you want to treat the child you don't want the alarm going away. It will pause for one minute. Bearing in mind the rate displayed on the monitor, Dr Jayram estimates the tube would have been dislodged between 30 to 60 seconds and that is on the assumption the alarm had been cancelled once. The court hears Dr Jayram did not make a contemporaneous note of his suspicions or the alarm failing to activate. Child K remained unwell and later died. Medical expert Dr Evans viewed Lucy Letby's failure to summon help as soon as possible was unusual. 
The prosecution alleged that Lucy Letby was trying to kill child K when Dr. J. Ram walked in. In police interview, when Dr. J. Ram's account was put to her, she said no concerns had been raised at the time. She said the alarm had not sounded. She said child K was sedated and had not been moving around. She also did not recall either any significant fall in saturations or there being no alarm. She accepted that in the circumstances described by Dr. J. Ram, she would have expected the alarm to have sounded. She denied dislodging the tube and said she would have summoned help had Dr. J. Ram not arrived, saying she was, quote, possibly waiting to see if she self-corrected. We don't normally intervene straight away if they weren't dangerously low, end quote. After the interviews, that suggestion made by Lucy Letby was referred to a nursing expert. Her view was that it was very unlikely that a nurse would leave the bedside of an intubated neonate unless they were very confident that the ET tube was correctly located and secure. The baby was inactive and then they would only be away only briefly. The nurse dismissed the idea that a competent nurse would have delayed intervention if there had been a desaturation. Letby was found to have researched Child K's parents on Facebook in April 2018, two years and two months after Child K had died. When asked about this, she said she did not recall doing so. The next case concerns twin brothers. Mr Johnson refers to Child L first. Child L attempted murder by insulin. Child L was born in April 2016. It is the prosecution case let be poisoned Child L while also attacking Child M, the twin. Child L's blood glucose level was noted to be low and he was treated with a dextrose infusion. His condition improved and he was stable by the daytime shift on April the 9th. Let be came on duty that day at 7.30am. By this time, the prosecution say... Letby was supposed only to be working day shifts because the consultants were concerned about the correlation between her presence and unexpected deaths and life-threatening episodes on the night shifts. In the hours that followed, child L's glucose levels fell abnormally low. He was given additional doses of glucose, but they proved ineffective. The answers to these levels were found after a lab sample sent to the Royal Liverpool Teaching Hospital Laboratory came back with results some time later. The results of these tests were, quote, grossly abnormal, but nothing was done about it as child L had, by the time the results came back, returned to normal. The reading was, quote, at the very top of the scale the equipment could measure, the court hears. There was no correspondingly high level of C-peptide. It was within the normal range. The only explanation for this anomaly is that what was being measured was synthetic insulin, which had not been prescribed to child L, but was stored and readily available in a neonatal unit. The court is shown an infusion therapy prescription sheet, a written record of the dextrose bag fed to child L. The bag was running from noon on April the 8th when it had been set up an hour earlier by Letby and another nurse. Prosecutor Nicholas Johnson KC, quote, we say Lucy Letby added insulin to that bag of dextrose. She did it deliberately to kill child L. She had failed to kill child F, so gave an increased dose. Letby had been present for the birth of child L. She cared for him on his first day, and the prosecution say would have been aware of his mild hypoglycemia. Child L's blood sugar level remained dangerously low through the day. At 4.30pm, a new infusion bag was required, and this was being applied when child L, the twin brother, was being taken ill. The prosecution says medical expert evidence is this was a case of insulin poisoning, administered intravenously via child L's liquid feed. In police interview, Letby said she was aware of child L's low blood sugar levels and knew that insulin was kept in a locked fridge, with a variety of other drugs. Keys were passed around nursing staff, and there was no record of who held the keys at any time. She agreed that insulin could not have been administered accidentally, but denied being responsible. Her explanation was it must have been in one of the bags already being received. The prosecution say that is not a credible possibility. Child M was born in good condition, and was assessed as requiring special care. He had an unexpected life-threatening event at around 4pm on April the 9th, at the same time his twin's blood sugar was dangerously low. The prosecution say, quote, he came close to death, but within four hours he was able to breathe unsupported. At 3.30pm, a fluid bag was attached to child M. 
At 3.45pm, he received intravenous antibiotics. The note showed Letby was one of two to administer the medicine. Digital records show Letby's colleague was using the computer at 3.45pm. At 4pm, Child M's monitor alarmed and Letby was first to the cot. The emergency was such that doctors were called urgently. The consultant Dr. J. Ram attended and noticed unusual patches of discoloration on Child M's skin, which he thought particularly noticeable because of Child M's skin tone. He thought the patches unusual because normally if a baby arrests and there is not enough oxygen moving around the body, the baby is uniformly pale, grey or blue. What he saw, he thought similar to what he had seen during the resuscitations of Child A and B. Child M did not respond well to resuscitation. Six doses of adrenaline followed in 25 minutes and treatment was, quote, about to be withdrawn when Child M suddenly improved. Dr. J. Ram could not find any cause for the sudden collapse, but the discoloration he saw caused him to suspect an air embolism. At 9.14pm, let's be noted Child M was tensing his limbs, curling fingers and toes and rotating hands and feet inwards, signs of brain damage. On the following night shift, Child M had what the prosecution called, quote, a speedy recovery, although he did suffer further desaturations. Medical expert Dr. Evans said the rapid recovery would not have meant infection or a lung problem was likely. His conclusion was airway obstruction or air embolus. A paediatric neuroradiologist reviewed a brain scan in May 2016 and found brain damage for Child M, likely caused by the cardiorespiratory collapse on April 9th. Mr Johnson, on behalf of the prosecution, says, When Letby's home was searched in 2018, a handwritten log of drugs administered during Child M's collapse was found, and she had made a note of the collapse in her diary. Quote, LD, long day, twin recess, end quote. In police interview, Letby agreed she had connected a fluid bag to Child M and a cosign for medication at 3.45pm, but could not be sure if she had administered it. She thought she must have taken the notes home, quote, by accident, and had simply noted what had happened in her diary. She denied that the notes were a souvenir, and denied deliberately trying to harm Child M. She could think of no reason how he would have suffered an air embolism. The prosecution says the cases of Child E to F and Child L to M are similar, in that one suffered an insulin overdose and the other an IV air embolism. Mr Johnson states, quote, We suggest that coincidences like that simply do not happen innocently. Someone was responsible and the only credible candidate is Lucy Letby. Child N attempted murder. Three allegations. Child N, a boy, was born in June 2016. He was a couple of weeks premature and he was admitted to the neonatal unit. His clinical condition was excellent. The prosecution say there are three separate occasions on which Lucy Letby tried to kill him. Child N had haemophilia. Subsequent investigation found him to have a mild version of the disease and children of his age do not bleed for no reason, particularly in the throat, the prosecution say. The prosecution said Lucy Letby used Child N's haemophilia as a, quote, cover to attack him. On the night of June 2nd, Letby was on the shift and not the designated nurse for Child N. She had earlier texted friends and sent a message to a colleague saying, quote, We've got a baby with haemophilia. She sent a further text saying, quote, Everyone bit panicked by seams of things, although baby appears fine. At 8.04pm, she sent a text saying that she was going to, quote, Google haemophilia. Seven minutes later, Letby text her colleague, quote, Complex condition, yeah, 50-50 chance antenatally, end quote. The designated nurse said Child N was stable and left for a break at about 1am. He would have asked a colleague to look after Child N, but he could not recall which one. Let B had two babies to care for in room 4. At 1.05am, Child N's oxygen sat levels fell from 99% to 40%. Unusually for a baby, he was described as crying and screaming. Child N recovered quickly while the doctor was then called to another emergency. Medical expert Dr. Evans said he believed the deterioration of Child N was, quote, consistent with some kind of inflicted injury which caused severe pain, end quote. 
Dr. Sandy Bowen said such a profound desaturation followed by a rapid recovery in the absence of any painful or uncomfortable procedure suggested an inflicted painful stimulus. She said, quote, this is life threatening. He was also noted to be screaming and apparently cried for 30 minutes. This is most unusual. I have never observed a premature neonate to scream. 12 days later, there were two separate incidents on June 15th for child N. Letby had been the designated nurse for the previous day. Overnight, he was in nursery three. At the beginning of the night shift, child N was, quote, very unsettled. Letby was to be the designated nurse for June 15th. The use of her phone appeared to show she was awake by 5.10am and in for her shift at 7.12. She had texted a colleague that she had, quote, escaped room one and was back in room three. A colleague said Lucy Letby came into the room to say hello, but when the nurse's back was turned, Letby told her child N had desaturated before assisting with the breathing. There was no evidence of an alarm sounding or if Letby waited to see if he self-corrected. Doctors were called and an attempt was made to intubate child N. He was, quote, surprised by his anatomy more than anything else. I could not visualise parts of the back of his throat because of the swelling. The doctor saw fresh blood in child N's throat, which the prosecution say was the same scene in child C, E and G. The doctor was unable to get the breathing tube down the throat of child N as he was unable to visualise the child's tracheal inlet. He attempted to intubate child N on three occasions. An intensive care chart is presented to the court, which records the amount of dextrose going into child N. The bleeding record of 10 a.m. 1 mil fresh blood recording aspirates from the NG tube. Said bleeding, the prosecution say, is not recorded anywhere in the medical notes. It was more than two hours after the attempts to intubate. At 11.29 a.m., Letby sent a Facebook message to the doctor telling him, quote, small amounts of blood from mouth and 1 mil from NG. Looks like pulmonary bleed on x-ray, i.e. a bleed from the lungs, Given factor 8, wait and see, end quote. Other than that phone message, there is no evidence that Lucy Letby brought the bleeding to the attention of any of the medical staff. The prosecution said this is surprising, given the problems child N had suffered. In an update recorded on the computer notes by Lucy Letby at 1.53pm, she wrote that child N was, quote, stiff on handling and extending upper limbs, back arching, settled in between episodes. The prosecution say this is similar to that found in other cases heard so far. At 3pm, there is a further entry in Letby's writing of free meal blood, initialed not by Letby and coincides with a second collapse that day. Child N collapsed just before 3pm and a consultant was called at 2.59pm. While awaiting a consultant, a junior doctor looked into the airway of Child N and saw a, quote, large swelling at the end of his epiglottis. He could only just see the bottom of the vocal cords. He had never seen anything like this in a newborn baby. The junior doctor's notes, made at 4.30pm, recorded, quote, desaturated this afternoon at 2.50pm, with blood in the oropharynx and blood in the NG tube, improved with bagging. Elective intubation planned following unsuccessful attempts with two registrars and two consultants, cords difficult to visualise. Let's be recorded at 6.30pm, quote, Approximately 14.50, infant became apneic with desaturation to 44%, heart rate 90 beats per minute, fresh blood noted from mouth and three mils of blood aspirated from NG tube. DRS crash called. The prosecution said child N was so unwell that attempts were made to reintubate him, but the doctor could not see down child N's throat as the view was obstructed by fresh blood. A more specialist team was called to carry out the intubation. Child N continued to be unwell on June the 15th and difficulties with ventilation persisted. Eventually he was transferred to Alderhay where the prosecution say he recovered quickly. Medical expert Dr. Evans said the blood seen in child N's stomach had originated there, caused not from intubation attempts, but quote, instead some preceding trauma. He suggested that thrusting an NG tube into the back of the throat might be the mechanism used to inflict the injury. Dr. Sandy Bowen suggested only two possible explanations, either inflicted trauma or a spontaneous bleed. 
She considers the latter less likely as the haemophilia was quote only moderate. Dr Bowen's view was that the likely cause of the bleeding was trauma to the mouth, to the throat or to the oropharynx, most likely from an NGT or suction catheter. Professor Sally Kinsey describes the collapse on June the 3rd as dramatic with no recognised medical cause. She excluded the possibility of a pulmonary haemorrhage, in other words, bleeding in the lungs causing the collapse on June the 15th. In her opinion, such bleeding would not have occurred spontaneously in a child with child ends degree of haemophilia. It follows the prosecution say the bleeding was caused by trauma. Professor Kinsey also ruled out heavy-handed intubation as a cause. In police interview, Letby had difficulty remembering child N. She did recall an occasion when doctors had difficulty intubating him. She agreed that she had seen blood, but denied being responsible for causing him harm. She could not explain the entry in her notes timed at 10am on June the 15th, in which she recorded aspirating more fresh blood, which she had not apparently brought to the attention of anyone else. Child O Murder Allegation Child O and Child P were two of three triplet brothers the court hears. Child O weighed 2.02 kilograms, which was good for a premature triplet. He was in good condition and made good progress. He was stable up till June the 23rd, when he suffered what Dr Evans said was a quote, remarkable deterioration and died. Between June the 15th and June the 23rd, Lucy Letby had been on holiday in Ibiza. Child O's body was examined after his death and an injury to his liver was found. Letby was working the day shift on June the 23rd and was the designated nurse for Child O and P in room 2 with another child. The prosecution that say this quote gave her an opportunity to sabotage the babies. The third of the triplets was in room 1, the doctors believing he was the most needy of the triplets. Letby also had the responsibility of supervising a student nurse that day. The designated nurse recorded quote, no nursing concern, observations normal for child O. There are three records of feeds by Letby at 8.30am, 10.30am and 12.30pm. The earliest signed by the student nurse, the latter two signed by Letby. In a note made by the doctor at 1.15pm, there was quote, one vomit post feed with abdomen distended. Child O was put onto IV fluids as a precaution. Child O's heart rate was 160 to 170, blood gases were low and raised CO2 level. The doctor recorded the results as quote, not normal for a child breathing on their own and treated for suspected NEC. It was fought down to child O's swallowing of air or the passing of a stool earlier. An x-ray taken at the time showed a moderate amount of gas in the bowel loops throughout the abdomen. Let be noted at 8.35 p.m. quote, Reviewed by registrar at 1.15 p.m., child O had vomited undigested milk, tachycardic and abdomen distended. NG tube placed on free drainage. 10 ml saline bolus given as prescribed along with antibiotics. Placed kneel by mouth and abdominal x-ray performed. Observations returned to normal. Prior to child O's collapse, a colleague said of child O, quote, he doesn't look as well now as he did earlier. Do you think we should move him back to room one to be safe? Letby did not agree. The prosecution say this echoes the final fatal collapse of child I. Letby had taken child O's observations at 2.30 p.m. as 100% oxygen saturations and normal breathing rates. From her phone, she was on Facebook Messenger at the time, and at 2.39 p.m., the door entry system recorded her coming into the neonatal unit. Within a few minutes of that, child O suffered his first collapse. Letby called for help, having been alone with child O in room 2 at the time. Child O's heart rate and saturations had dropped to dangerously low levels. A breathing tube was inserted by the medical staff and he was successfully resuscitated. He was kept on a ventilator. At 3.49pm, Child O desaturated again. Doctors removed the ET and replaced it as a precaution. Letby's written notes suggest she was the one who called for help. Child O suffered a further collapse at 4.15pm which required CPR. Those efforts were unsuccessful and Child O died soon after treatment was withdrawn at 5.47pm. 
A consultant doctor noted Child O had an area of discoloured skin on the right side of his chest wall which was purpuric. He noted a rash at 4.30pm which had gone by 5.15 and did not consider it purpura, but unsure what it was or what had caused it. The doctor was particularly concerned about Child O's death as he was clinically stable before these events. His collapse was so sudden and he did not respond to resuscitation as he should have. After the shift, Let B sent a series of messages to the doctor on Facebook and to her colleague. She suggested Child O quote, had a big tummy overnight, but just ballooned after lunch and went from there. A post-mortem examination found free unclotted blood in the peritoneal abdominal space from a liver injury. There was damage in multiple locations on and in the liver. The blood was found in the peritoneal cavity. He certified death on the basis of natural causes and intra-abdominal bleeding. He observed that the cause of this bleeding could have been asphyxia, trauma or vigorous resuscitation. The prosecution say no one would have thought a nurse would have assaulted a child in a neonatal unit. Dr Evans concluded Child O's death was the result of a combination of intravenous air embolus and trauma. The liver injury was not in his view consistent with vigorous CPR. His view was that the liver damage would have occurred before the collapse and contributed to it and was probably the reason for his symptoms through the morning. As for the air in the bowel loops, Dr Evans concluded that that was consistent with excessive air going down via the NGT. Dr Bowen concluded that together with the chest wall discoloration seen by the doctor, that was indicative of air having been injected into child O's circulation. She agreed that the abdominal distension was due to excess gas via the NGT. Dr Andreas Menarides, the reviewing pathologist, thought that the liver injuries were most likely the result of impact type trauma and not the result of CPR. He thought that the excess air via the NGT was likely to have led to stimulation of the vagal nerve which has an effect on heart rate and would have compromised child O's breathing. He could not say whether it was either of these factors in isolation or in combination which caused child O's death. He certified the cause of death to be quote, inflicted traumatic injury to the liver and profound gastric and intestinal distension following acute excessive injection or infusion of air via a nasogastric tube and air embolus. In police interview, Letby said she had responded to Child O's alarm at 1.15pm and found he had vomited. She responded at 2.40pm and discovered mottling all over with purple blotches and red rash. She said that his abdomen just kept swelling and suggested that sometimes babies can gulp air when they are receiving assistance from Optiflow, as Child O was. A year later, on the anniversary of Child O's death, let be carried out a search on Facebook on the surname of the child. Let be was a designated nurse for Child P. Let be fed Child P donor expressed breast milk at 8am, 10am, noon, 2pm and 6pm. The final feed, if accurately recorded, was about 13 minutes after Child O had died. A feeding chart is presented to the court. All the feeds from 8am to 4pm are signed by a student nurse and co-signed by Letby. The 6pm feed is signed only by Letby. The court hears on the day shift feeds there is nothing more than a quote trace aspirate, checking if there is anything in the stomach before the baby is fed apart from a small amount of vomit at noon. The 8pm feed, the first after Let Be Shift, produced a 14 ml milk acidic pH free aspirate. The court hears because Child O had died in unusual circumstances, Child P was reviewed by Dr Gibbs at 6pm. The abdomen was full, mildly distended, there was no tenderness and he had active bowel sounds, good signs. He was screened for infection, an x-ray taken at 8pm showed striking gaseous distension throughout the stomach and whole bowel. Lucy Letby made her nursing notes at 8.24pm, therefore she was still in a neonatal at this time, Mr Johnson tells the court. The allegation is Letby deliberately caused the problems as she was ending her day shift, so she would not be detected, Mr Johnson tells the court. On that night shift, milk feeds were stopped for child P on the grounds that a further large part digested aspirate was drawn up from the NGT at feeding time. At 6.39am, a nurse recorded the abdomen was quote, soft and non-distended. 
25 mil of air had been aspirated by one of the nurses and the NGT had been placed on free drainage. Mr Johnson said the problem child P had when let be handed over to the night shift had been resolved. The problem appeared to be air. When the next day shift happened, let be was child P's designated nurse again. He was with his other brother, the third of the triplets, in room two. The court hears, as events unfolded, while Letby was the designated nurse for the other triplet, care was transferred to another nurse. Text messages Letby sent to a doctor at just after 8.30am suggest she had sent or was sending her student with a baby who needed an MRI scan. A registrar noted child P at 9.30am had quote DSAT and Brady's and had a moderately distended bloated abdomen and slightly mottled skin. Letby's nursing notes from that night, 9.18pm to 10pm, recorded, quote, written in retrospect, NG tube on free drainage, trace amount in tube, abdomen full, loops visible, soft to touch, reg dot 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 arrived to carry out ward round, child P had apnea, Brady, D sat with mottled appearance requiring facial oxygen and neopuff for approximately one minute, abdomen becoming distended, Decision made to carry out bloods and gas approximately 9.30. The prosecution says it follows the problem with which child P had been handed over by Letby to the night shift, but then apparently reappeared within 90 minutes of Letby taking over again. 15 minutes later, child P had an acute deterioration. A crash call went out. Child P was intubated and improved, and efforts were made to transfer him to Arrow Park Hospital. Child P desaturated again at 11.30am. He was given adrenaline. His spontaneous circulation improved, but he continued to deteriorate through the day. A punctured lung was identified from an x-ray taken at 11.57am. Treatment started at 12.40pm. The transport team arrived at 3pm. Just before they arrived, child P's blood gases were taken and were satisfactory. A doctor was hopeful of child P's prospects. The court hears let be said to her something like, quote, he's not leaving here alive, is he? Child P's final collapse came at 3.14pm, and despite resuscitative efforts, he died at 4pm. A post-mortem examination had the coroner concluding Child P died from sudden unexpected postnatal collapse, but he was unable to identify the underlying cause. He certified the cause of death as prematurity. Medical expert Dr Evans initially suggested the cause of death was complications from his pneumothorax. He was, however, suspicious of the large volume of air in the stomach and intestines evident on x-ray. In his subsequent reports, Dr Evans concluded that excess air in the stomach could have splinted child P's diaphragm, compromising his breathing. Dr Sandy Bowen also concluded that the abdominal distension splinted child P's diaphragm, resulting in an inability fully to expand his lungs and causing his collapse. Subsequent resuscitation and intubation involved high ventilatory pressures, which together with vigorous resuscitation can cause pneumothorax. She described the abnormal gas pattern seen in child P's stomach, which she concluded was caused by injection of air via the NGT describing that as, quote, the only plausible explanation. This excess gas splinted the diaphragm, compromised breathing, and it caused child P's collapse. Mr Johnson tells the court, quote, As with all these cases, it is the coincidence of problems happening when Lucy Letby was about, and the coincidence of the same problems happening with different babies at different times, which we suggest is so telling and indicates that it was her malign hand at work. In police interviews, let be said the student nurse fed child P at two hourly intervals on June the 23rd, and she had fed child P alone at 6pm. She said she had agreed to be child P's designated nurse because the parents had asked for some continuity. Early in the shift, around 8am, she could see loops in his tummy and brought these to the attention of the doctor and notes were made later that day. If what she noted was true, the prosecution say, it would say when she took over the care from the previous night, he had a developing problem. But the prosecution say we know that was not the case. A note by a nurse at 6.39am ran contrary to Letby's note, as the problem had been resolved during the night. 
Mr. Johnson states, this is another example of Lucy Letby making factually false entries in the notes to cover herself. Let's be denied deliberately causing child P any harm. Child Q attempted murder allegation. Child Q was born on June 22nd, the day after child O and P. He was premature but a good weight and on CPAP for the first 20 hours. He was admitted to the neonatal unit as he needed breathing support but was initially stable. He had a catheter in place via his umbilicus for nutrition, however he was well enough to commence feeding via his NGT. Initially he was put into room 1. Nursing staff noted small amounts of bile when they checked his NGT on June 23rd, 24th. These were not of sufficient concern to stop him being fed milk. A different nurse was Child K's designated nurse on the night shift for June the 24th. She monitored him through the night and fed him 0.5 ml of milk every two hours at 3am, 5am and 7am. The nurse was content with the condition, although the blood gases deteriorated slightly so she referred the results to a doctor. The doctor reviewed them and was not concerned. The day shift on June 25th, Letby was on duty and was Child Q's designated nurse. Child Q had been moved into room 2. Let's be made notes on Child Q's fluid feeding chart at 8am. Child Q was receiving nutrition baby then via UVC. Just after 9am, Let's be and the nurse were together in nursery 2 and it was feeding time. The other nurse attended to another child in the room. According to the record, Child Q's heart and respiratory rates both increased for a short period of time. But the prosecution say the feeding chart shows something unusual. That chart is shown to the court. The 9am fluid chart in Letby's handwriting appears unfinished, with numbers noted for fluids but no record for the feed or Letby's signature initials at the bottom of the 9am column. The prosecution suggests something caused Letby to leave halfway through doing this. Letby signed for medication for another baby at 9.04am. The other nurse agreed to keep an eye on child Q at 9am. A few minutes later, child Q's monitor alarms activated to alert staff to a deterioration in his condition. Mr Johnson tells the court, We say that Lucy Letby had sabotaged child Q and had ejected him with air and a clear fluid into his stomach via the NGT. She was trying to kill him. The nurse called for help and was joined by another nurse. Child Q had been sick and nurses used a suction catheter while respiratory support was given. Lucy Letby appeared soon afterwards together with doctors who were responding to the call for help. Medical notes indicate doctors were called to the unit at 9.17am as Child Q had just vomited and oxygen saturation levels were in the low 60s. The prosecution say medical staff gave him assistance with breathing using a Neopuff device and applied suction to clear his airways. The records indicate not only had his oxygen dropped but also his heart rate. He is described as mottled in appearance and most significantly a substantial amount of air was aspirated from his stomach via the NGT. Mr Johnson tells the court that air had been put in there by Letby. As if the feeding chart had been followed correctly at 9am, the person feeding, let be, would have aspirated child Q's stomach to check there was nothing there before administering the 0.5ml milk feed. Another nurse's medical note on an apnea Brady fit chart notes quote, 9.10am, Brady 98, DSAT 68, baby found to be very mucosy, clear mucose from nasopharynx, oropharynx removed, clear fluid. O2 via Neopuff given post suctioning, doctor emergency called to attend. NGT used to aspirate stomach by nurse L. Letby. The prosecution say, given that Letby was Child Q's designated nurse and she performed the aspiration of air, it might be thought surprising that she did not make the note. Yet she did make notes in records of other babies' notes at about the same time. We question whether this is an attempt by her to create a documentary alibi. Computerized nursing notes made by Letby for that morning state 9.10 hours, child Q attended to by SN. He had vomited clear fluid nasally and from mouth. Desaturation and bradycardia. Mottled, neopuff and suction applied. Registrar attended, air aspirated from NG tube. Following the collapse, blood was taken to test for infection and other parameters. 
A venous blood gas test showed results suggesting he was unwell, but this had resolved by 11.12am. He was started on a course of antibiotics as a precaution. The doctor's view recorded at the time said child Q's collapse was a result of presumed sepsis with jaundice. At that stage, a chest x-ray was taken which showed nothing untoward. The more detailed blood tests were recorded at 1.50pm and showed slightly abnormal results which were treated. Child Q had made a reasonable recovery through the day and at 7.20pm was looking tired. Doctors took the decision to intubate him because his respiratory rate was down to 19 and his heart rate was between 160 to 200 beats per minute. At that stage his blood gas readings were good. The prosecution say Lucy Letby was worried when she got home that night. She texted a doctor at 10.46pm and asked quote, Do I need to be worried about what Dr G was asking? The doctor sought to put her mind at rest and told her that Dr G was only asking to make sure that the normal procedures were carried out. She replied that after child Q had collapsed, she, Lucy Letby, had walked into the equipment room and Dr G had been asking the other nurse who was present in the room how quickly someone had got to him because she, Lucy Letby, had not been there. She continued her text to the doctor, telling him that she had needed to go to her designated baby in room 1. The following day, Child Q's gases were unsatisfactory, but he had been extubated four hours earlier and was in air with high saturations. Medical staff noted a quote, mildly dilated loop of bowel on Child Q's left side and raised the possibility of NEC and surgery. Child Q was transferred to Alderhay where he quickly stabilised and no surgery was required. The prosecution say this was another child who had suffered life-threatening problems and, when out of the orbit of Lucy Letby, he made a rapid recovery. Other than three days the following week, that was the last time Lucy Letby worked in a neonatal unit at the Countess of Chester Hospital, the court is told. Medical expert Dr Evans said child Q's collapse was due to inappropriate care and he had been injected with air via the NGT. The significant amount of air aspirated from his stomach could not have arisen in any other way. Dr Sandy Bowen noted Child Q was well up until June 25th and believed something happened between 9am and his collapse. He was only being fed what Dr Bowen describes as tiny amounts of milk, yet he had taken in copious amounts of air from the NGT. This was abnormal. The effect of a large volume of air in the stomach would squash the lungs, leading to desaturation and instability. Although a baby may recover quickly after such an event, he may remain unstable for some time thereafter. She agreed with Dr Evans' conclusion that the events were consistent with the introduction of a large amount of air via the NGT. A professor reviewed brain imaging of child Q, taken in November 2019, more than three years later. He found evidence of abnormalities which, whilst they were not diagnostic of him having suffered a brain injury as a result of being given excess air and liquid via his NGT, they could be explained. In Letby's home search, officers recovered the handover sheet from the morning of June 25th, which included Child Q's name. This was a document which should not have left the hospital. When interviewed by police, Letby agreed Child Q had been well enough for her to leave him on the morning of June 25th. When asked about the excess air aspirated from his stomach, she suggested babies sometimes gulp air when they vomit. She denied putting excess air down the NGT. Mr Johnson, on behalf of the prosecution, tells the court, Following those events, the consultant suspected that the deaths and life-threatening collapses of these 17 children were not medically explicable and were the result of the actions of Lucy Letby. No doubt they were acutely aware that making such an allegation against a nurse was as serious as it gets. They, at the time, did not have the benefit of the evidence that you will hear. The hospital took the decision to remove Lucy Letby from a hands-on role. She was moved to clerical duties where she would not come into contact with children. The police were contacted and began a very lengthy and complex inquiry. This involved the police contacting independent paediatricians and other specialists to review many cases which had passed through the NNU at the COCH. Following that review, the decision was taken to arrest Lucy Letby. The first arrest came in July 2018. On July the 3rd, she was arrested at her home, where the house was searched. 
In addition to some of the paperwork, they found some other interesting items. There were some post-it notes with closely written words on them, some of which included the names of some of her colleagues. On some of the notes were phrases such as, quote, Why, how has this happened? What process has led to this current situation? What allegations have been made and by who? Do they have written evidence to support their comments? In her writings, she expressed frustration at the fact she was not being allowed back on the neonatal unit and wrote, quote, I haven't done anything wrong, and they have no evidence, so why have I had to hide away? Her notes also expressed concern for the long-term effects of what she feared was being alleged against her, and there are also many protestations of innocence. On another piece of paper, she wrote, quote, I don't deserve to live. I killed them on purpose because I'm not good enough. I'm a horrible, evil person. And in capital letters, I am evil, I did this. That, in a nutshell, Mr Johnson tells the court, is your case.